Welcome everybody. Welcome to AGL Live. I'm Elizabeth Raley and I'm in the working group of AGL. I'm going to kick us off today by telling you a little bit more about our organization. AgileGov Leadership is a nonprofit organization that aims to transform the culture of government by bringing agile and innovative practices to public service delivery through shared knowledge and community. You can find out more about us, contact us, or sign up for our newsletter on our website, agilegovleaders.org. Um, today's AGL is about managing agile contracts in government, and we're joined by some innovative people who have done just that. We would love audience participation and welcome you to post questions in uh, the Zoom chat for our panelists. And now I'm going to pass to Joey Spooner, who's going to moderate our discussion today, and he will continue. Uh, the introductions. Hi, Joey. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar today. Uh, my name is Joey Spooner. I'm a uh, Kanban coach and professional trainer, and uh, I work for a company called TriTech Enterprise Systems. We're here in the DC area, and uh, we're really excited today that I can uh, participate in helping to host this session on contracting. All right, so I'd like to call on Ala, if I could, for a minute to introduce herself, and we'll go from there. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you so much to AGL for the opportunity to participate. My name is Ala, and I'm the Acting Outgoing uh, Director of the Office of Acquisition at the GSA's Technology Transformation Service. That's a sister office to ATF, and it is both an operational contracting shop as well as an acquisition consulting organization that does uh, ghostwriting and other consulting services for state and local as well as federal agencies. And uh, I've been running the shop for a couple of years now. Um, we have both 1102 operational contracting folks as well as sort of um, contracting SMEs that, are, uh, that work in more of a consultancy role. Uh, and we take a cross-functional approach to procurement, which is to say that we have both uh, the 1102 job series as well as a variety of other job series to include engineers, product managers, and designers, all of whom work on the acquisition team to uh, write great agile contracts. So excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ala. And uh, Ben Hafer, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Yeah, sure. My name is Ben Hafer. I'm the Director of Business Development at Civic Actions. I'm an advocate for agile ways, free and open source software, and fostering a culture of government transformation and civic engagement by transforming the way governments procure, develop, and deliver digital services. In my previous role, I was the Chief of Operations for the Child Welfare Digital Services Project in the state of California. Um, we were working on, I oversaw multiple state and hired contractor teams working in a variety of environments to develop web and mobile applications, uh, the underlying technology platform and data architecture. Um, in my role here, I was a part of the California project that went through the Agile transformation. So uh, I virtually wrote all of the Agile uh, contracts that came through our project and it was quite a transformation from the original waterfall ways that we do large projects and so i'm happy to talk about our our uh our, our travels and how we got to where we were thank you awesome thanks so much ben we're happy you're here uh florence would you mind introducing yourself please not at all so hi can everyone hear me yes great so my name is florence I am what's called a digital service expert within the USDS, the United States Digital Service. Um, I'm currently with the VA, detailed with the VA to um, help with their digital um, contracts. I am a former contracting officer at 1102. I was, before I was here, I was director of acquisitions for the IT portfolio within HHS, one of the optives there. And before that, I worked um, within DOD as a contracting officer, um, leading um, teams with contracting of IT services and, and supplies. Um, I was part of the first DITAP, Digital IT Acquisition Professional Program, um, that rolled through USDS. I was in collaboration with OFPP. Um, and so I'm really, really a believer in um, working toward informing more 1102s and contracting officers, cores, um, and program offices on how to go about the process of pulling together um, agile contracts and then administering them, which can be quite challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, well, thanks so much, Florence, for joining us. And Dave, would you mind introducing yourself? 
Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Svenich. Um, I am no longer with the government, uh, but I recently left uh, the General Services Administration, uh, where I was working in the Office of Systems Management uh, as the Assistant Commissioner and the Senior Technical Advisor. Uh, before that, I was the Executive Director of 18F, uh, and before that, I was the uh, Director of the Office of Tech DTS acquisition, which Allah is currently running, um, and my uh, I, since leaving government, I now uh, I'm an independent consultant helping organizations and government work smarter together. Excellent, excellent. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Dave. So let's get started. What we're going to do here is I'm just going to ask you guys some questions, and we're going to see uh, what your answers are to these to kind of figure out uh, where things are and where things are going these days with contract management. So uh, for those of you guys who are on the call. Uh, how did you determine uh, Agile was necessary for contract management? Anyone want to answer that one? When did you guys? Sure. So, yeah. I, <laughs> so I was, when I was a contracting officer um, within DOD, I had been, lived through a number of, um, you know, awarding a contract for software development services. And they had been, um, you know, we'd been, doing the traditional waterfall um, process over and over again and just waiting, you know, waiting the 11 months, waiting 12 months for like the box to be magically opened for us to get what we, what we um, secured. And it became clear that that, that was not, um, it was, became clear because of a few unsuccessful launches that there had to be another way. Um, I actually went to a conference um, and learned about Agile at that conference years ago and said, this is something that we really need to, to take a look at. Um, and so started to pull that thread and it became, once, once I lived through my first um, Agile contract, I said, this is definitely a, something that we need to look at. It, it, was, it was quite bumpy, a lot, <laughs> the, the, the initial one, um, but it was, it ended up being I am making me a believer in terms of small, um, iterative, um, pro the, the process was small enough that we could, we can detect what was working and what was not working, um, before 12 months, 10 months burned. Um, and so, and the, the process of it being very interactive was really interesting and engaging for the whole team. Awesome. So it was that shorter feedback time and that, that sort of uh, getting that uh, information in your hands a little sooner rather than having to wait so long. Would that exactly. Be yeah. Exactly. And I would jump in to say that it's sort of a chicken and egg thing with respect to contract management, which is that you manage the contract that is, you manage an agile contract because the work that needs to be done is performed in an agile way. Um, and so to the extent that you are having an agile software development project that is built iteratively, that's using human-centered design, that is sort of implementing all the good things. Um, the way to manage that work is not to then revert back to a waterfall approach, to refer back to a waterfall quality assurance surveillance plan. The, the idea is you also want to change the way you manage the contract so that it mirrors uh, the work that's being performed in the way that the work is being performed. Oh, that's a good answer. Uh, ben, what did you guys, uh, what caused you guys to think of doing this approach? What, what was the trigger for it? Yeah, so the Child Welfare Project in California had been um, attempted many times. And, and as, as we know in large government projects that are you know, half a billion to a billion dollars in, in size and scope, um, they tend to be very complex and take a very long time. It literally could take years just to write a number of requirements in advance of a system that that's going to be built years uh, down the line. So you always get exactly what you ask for, but not what you want. Uh, one of the things that we determined in this analysis um, in, in correlation with 18F and USDS and Code for America was, you know, this huge, large project initiative to replace the child welfare case management system was um, originally slated as a traditional waterfall approach. And so in 2015, the strategy changed to more of an iterative, agile digital services solution. Uh, with that, it allowed us to kick off the project much quicker and actually start writing code, even when we would be developing requirements or even onboarding uh, like a system integrator. 
Um, one of the things that was really interesting about the, the, the whole concept of using Agile on contract management, and David was there actually with us this whole time trying to figure this out, was we got a number of attorneys. I've never seen this many attorneys in the same room to go through and figure out why this would be illegal. <laughs> and after a week of having uh, all of these attorneys in the same room, we, we came to find out, in this, at least in the state of California, nothing that we're attempting is illegal. Nothing is going against procurement or contract law, and it can actually be done this way. It's just nobody had yet. <laughs> so it was very innovative in its time, and we're seeing a lot of other states and, and local jurisdictions starting to go this way because uh, people are realizing it is a better way of, of procuring uh, software development uh, practices. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and just a small reference for you guys. Uh, I've worked on the sort of the, the buying side as well one time, and it took 13 months to buy something of which, out of that 13 month schedule, it was seven months of, of legal review, legal discussion, legal checks. Can we do this right? Can we do this right? It, it's amazing how much that does show up a lot when you're trying to procure something. It's, it's incredible. So along those lines of thought, uh, if you guys are okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, what are you referencing? Like, how did you figure out that this was the right way? You know, you have the legal team looking at this and saying, hey, does this fit right? Can we make it work? Was there something else like a precedent in the marketplace where you said, look, they've done it, or, you know, here's literature that tells us we can do it? So I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Um, I actually came to this a little bit backwards, uh, which is that I didn't start with uh, Agile. Um, I started with the idea that we had to have better post award management. Um, and, you know, everyone sort of focused on pre-award, 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 pre-award. And I said, you know, that's not where things really fall. They really fall in post-award management. Um, and so uh, when, when I joined h &F, we started to look at, all right, well, what, what, what are the best ways to manage uh, a contract post-award? And it came, you know, Agile was the solution at that point. So once we said, all right, cool, we've got Agile. Then I went back and tried to find the precedent. And we, uh, we found that this is actually not uh, the first time that people said, hey, if it break things up into successful chunks, you know, do things smaller, use iteration, get in front of real users. Turns out that in the mid-90s, uh, the Office of Management and Budget put out a memo and said, uh, do all of these good things. And Congress passed this thing called Thing of Cohen and said, uh, use iterative and modular contracting. And we go, hmm, that seems like a good precedent <laughs> that we might be all of the, for all the things that we're trying to do. Um, and so uh, we really uh, sort of anchored in a part of the FAR, the federal acquisition regulations that people largely ignored and used that as a starting point for a lot of the conversations. Awesome. And just for those in the For phone, those of you yeah. following along at home, that is FAR part 39. Yeah. <laughs> I knew someone was going to drop some numbers in here on us uh, for, you know, different regulations. So I was curious, uh, you had said something, Dave, really quickly about that. It was uh, some kind of a memo or some kind of thing from OMB. What was that called again? Yeah, it's Rains Rules. Rains uh, Rules. R A I N S A N E S, excuse me, Rob Rains, uh, and it's Rob Rains Rules. Oh, there we go. So for those on the call today, they'll have a little extra thing to learn there. That's awesome. So is anyone else referencing something else? I mean, that was a great answer by Dave. I'm curious, did anyone else say, okay, let's look into this further? Let's look at some other examples? Yeah, so yeah. before I joined, oh, go ahead, Florence. Oh, no. Um, so one, one piece that I um, have been referencing greatly has been the Tech Floor Hub um, that provides a lot of good information for um, those who, contracting officers who are kind of dipping their toes in or want to learn a bit more about the administration of contracts. There's a, there's a lot of good information there. I was kind of stumbling around in the dark um, when I started out and trying to figure out what should I do and how should I help my program office counter, um, counterparts and allies on this journey. And when I stumbled upon the Tech Bar Hub a few years ago, and it's been through a number of iterations in terms of the way that the information has, has come about, but it had, it, it had and it continues to have a lot of relevant information there. And if I can piggyback off of that, um, the TechFAR Hub is really uh, grounded in uh, the U.S. Digital Service principles, the playbook, the Digital Services Playbook. Um, and I found that uh, even before I joined ATNF, that uh, doing advocacy inside an agency when you have an OMB official website to point to really does create a fair amount of precedent uh, and does help alleviate fears, whether they be from general counsel or just other folks who, who may be managing risk. 
And so the U.S. Digital Services Playbook is sort of like uh, uh, when that came out, I think that did a lot to embolden and empower a lot of folks across government, certainly at the federal level, which is what I'm familiar with, uh, to really do advocacy for human-centered design for agile practices. Um, and then when the TechFAR hub came around, that was a way of implementing it in a very tactical way um, from the acquisition perspective. So it, it was really nice to be like, no, it's got a CIO.gov URL. This is coming from OMB. It's real. No one's going to get in trouble. And this is how we implement. Um, and that's been a really terrific resource. Um, that, and if I could just plug um, the ATNF blog, ATNF has uh, really tried to go out of its way to document a lot of lessons learned, as well as publish actual contracts and actual uh, documents uh, that folks have used. Um, and I know that before I joined ATNF, I was using it and I was emailing ATNF blog posts around um, and printing them out and putting them in briefing books for, uh, for my executives. Uh, because they, they sort of, you know, it's just yet another document and just another piece of collateral that underscores that doing things differently isn't going to put anyone in jail. And furthermore, it's going to really, uh, really cause better results. Awesome. Thank you, Allah. You know, uh, someone, uh, a lady named Michelle just asked a great question. She said uh, she'd like to know about payment structures because uh, some of the people inside the organization where she works, they have concerns about time and material arrangements, and they worry that the government is vulnerable, or the agency is vulnerable to vendors charging a lot without delivering a lot. Now, I just laid out a big piece of stake for you guys here probably to talk about. So uh, who would like to respond to that first? Dave, do it. I was thinking Dave, yeah, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take the bait. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the government spends a lot of money on stuff that we don't get all the time, right? Like that, that's actually not a new thing. Uh, the, the surprising thing is how often the government is willing to put, um, put out a uh, requirements, document solicitation, and then get back a responses like, yeah, we'll definitely deliver all this stuff and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to cost half a billion dollars and it'll be done in five years. And then four and a half years later, they go, well, we're not uh, going to hit the target. We're behind schedule. Um, also, please modify the contract um, and please add a couple more half a million dollars here, million dollars there, and things start to get out of control. Um, the reality for agile contracts is that you're actually managing capacity in a very different way. Um, so rather than having um, sort of an unexpected cost overruns, um, you're basically buying uh, a team uh, and buying the team's time uh, and um, capacity to deliver. And so that's really predictable. You know how many people are working on a project uh, and it really shifts the responsibility to how are we best managing those people to deliver something of value. Um, that is a hard thing. It requires focus on product management. It requires a focus on uh, value and governance. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, but in terms of throwing a lot of money after something that's not delivering, the benefit of Agile is that if that's the case, you just stop. Um, you, you're not delivering something of value, don't do that anymore, uh, as opposed to um, putting something on a major waterfall contract and then discovering, oops, you know, it didn't, doesn't work. If I could add, um, so with, with my project with the state of California, we, we struggle with that as well. Like how do, you do, how do you do time and material contracts to allow the flexibility of our agile teams to kind of go in the direction every two weeks, shifting, being able flexibility, flexibility, all of that. And um, it was a real, it was a real challenge. Uh, I was on the project for three years and we literally started um, the way that we developed contracts. Uh, and the, the way we started it is we developed um, short term contracts. So every contract that we put out was uh, like, like six months in duration and with like 700 optional extensions. <laughs> um, so what you do there is you have the long-term contract there to ensure that you're getting value in the teams that you have on, on site, but there's always that hook every six months. If you're not delivering, if we're not happy with your performance, if you're not, if you're not giving us value for the money that we're giving you, well then the next person up is, is on deck. And part of that was putting together um, the, the following the federal government and putting together a, an agile um, contracting mechanism to, to pre-authorize companies that were already following agile ways and allowing them to bid um, much more quickly on, on our projects. And 
of course, it brought up other struggles. So the struggles that came up were once you get to, say, 20 or 30 contracts being executed on a single contract, and every single one of them expire every six months, we were putting a massive load on your procurement team just to re-procure. As soon as they finish re-procuring a contract or extending a contract, they're already working on the next re-procurement. And of course, it's, you know, it's a lessons learned, and, and we found successfully that um, breaking up these large projects into these small solutions wasn't difficult. And we've also proved that small procurement teams can develop process and manage a large number of these vendor contracts because a lot of it came from just the repetition. You're, you're really using the same language and you're using the same contract uh, language and, and vehicles. And it ended up being a, a very, almost an automated process. You really, at that point, are, are focusing on vendor management versus contract management, which was much more um, successful. One last thing, if I can add about um, time and materials versus uh, from fixed price is one of the things that uh, it really begs a discussion about is risk. Um, and oftentimes folks think that from fixed price is just a lower risk to the agency because there's a cap on how much you can spend and the like. And um, one of the interesting ways uh, we've gone about talking about risk is really thinking about each individual sprint or each individual period of performance as a way to segment the risk itself to the agency, um, allowing uh, government to pivot if things are going in the wrong direction or if product management just isn't there or if uh, user research indicates that maybe the product isn't necessary, uh, that, that may seem silly, but sometimes that in and of itself is a win. And so if for some reason, um, if uh, you're struggling to implement time and materials for, um, for the agile cycle. Um, there is a way to sort of, um, the way Dave talked about it and the way Ben mentioned, there is sort of a way to use firm fixed price to give yourself those toll gates. Uh, but if you're able to, time and materials really allows you to segment risk with good product and uh, good vendor management and good management of the thing you're building. Um, because ultimately, uh, once the government is more involved in the creation and the build and the management of the thing, there is already less risk than uh, just pushing it aside, waiting five years and hope the thing that gets built is perfect. Awesome, thank you. Thank you all, that was a great answer. Yeah, um, that's just healthy management going up channel to make sure that you manage your risks accordingly even further up, which is great. Um, and I, this kind of hints at already the, the other question I was gonna ask you guys, which is how you're measuring success. So, uh, you know, um, Michelle had mentioned delivering results. Um, what are some of the key measures? I know uh, Scrum and Sprints are pretty active these days. Those are batch size measurements. So how are you guys measuring uh, success? What are your criteria in that case? And has that changed over time? And anyone's welcome to jump on that one. I can nominate Dave again if he's, he's smiling. So I'm gonna say Dave looks like the first one to go. How about I nominate someone else? Florence, Sounds do you wanna take that one? Yeah. Sure. So basically measuring tracking progress by saying is it completed do we have um if our user stories at the beginning of the sprint were completed and they it meets the mark of all of the um all of the metrics that were that we detailed at the beginning then it's been successful then we know um that the work has been completed and we know that we were we we're getting what we shot for at the beginning. Now, if there if during that sprint there were um, there were, there was information through discovery that prevented some of the metrics from being met, um, then that would more than like then there's a discussion in the retro that would roll those needs or requirements into the next sprint in order for those those to be completed. But we are really looking at completed work, a demonstration of working software at the end of each sprint. Hmm. Excellent. So I'll jump in and say, um, and, and this is more specific to the CWDS project, is I would say in California, the state has struggled to measure success. Um, the project had a difficulty aligning agile project activity with traditional state oversight metrics, you know, such as a multi-year schedule and budget. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, par that's a paradigm shift. 
Um, and it, it created significant confusion and alarm for our oversight teams and external stakeholders. Um, so, but internally, we were successful in measuring success more at the kind of the sprint level and within the teams themselves. You know, how, how are they interacting with other teams? How, how are they delivering code? You know, how are we getting product out the door? Um, and over time, we learned that we had better results improving performance at the individual level than at the vendor level. That, that really was how we measured success. But the challenge does remain that ongoing state preference for vendor level remedies, which is a holdover from your traditional outsourcing and waterfall projects, is going to be a, a problem. I mean, there's a greater future potential if we shift to individual level remedies in a multi-vendor environment rather than the traditional way that we procure and manage these contracts in the future. So can you, sorry, go ahead, Dave. Let me take a different tack on this a little bit. Um, not to get too theoretical for a moment, but one, one of the things that is a little bit um, backwards, I think, about how we think about um, oversight of the delivery teams that we have in, in a proper agile environment is like, if you're hiring experts, they will deliver excellent software, full stop. Like that's how that works. So what you need to do is you need to think about how you're structuring your acquisition so that you're getting actual experts in the door and then managing them in a way that actually is suggesting that they're gonna deliver a great product. And then it becomes a, a sort of a virtuous cycle. Um, you're delivering great stuff, everyone can see it, they're engaging users, they're using good products, tech, uh, product management techniques, and so it becomes uh, sort of a, a virtuous uh, cycle. Um, what I think what's sort of embedded in our sort of normal approach in government is that we're so used to the government buying things badly and buying things from non-experts and buying things from people that we expect to fail that we've built this entire sort of ecosystem around the expectation that you can't deliver. Um, and so trying to build a little bit more trust, trying to build uh, a, uh, a really performance-based uh, ecosystem with proper sort of metrics and um, a, a good organizational culture uh, will go a much longer way than having a nice, uh, you know, yellow, red, uh, yellow, red, green uh, uh, report. And uh, if I can piggyback off of that, what it really means is it means the government needs to have its act together to figure out what it's looking for and have either a product vision or a roadmap or user stories ahead of when it puts the contract out and writes the quality assurance surveillance plan. Like the idea that you can manage risk by just segmenting it or for fixed pricing it or shoving a 200 page requirements document at the vendor and say, yeah, but do it agile. Like that's not human centered. That's not how you deliver um, great working code for the American people. And so ultimately it's sort of um, great management of um, sort of in the firm fixed price mentality. And I'm seeing um, there's a question in the chat about uh, how do you procure a certain number of sprints from the vendor? How do you know when you're really done? Um, it really does go back to the user story and the su success criteria that the government has to lay out in the contract ahead of time. Um, sure, some contracts can work really well with a really good um, product manager on the government side where you're not necessarily driving toward a vision that you set up ahead of time and you're either paying per sprint or paying per story or you're, um, you, you've set up some sort of either for fixed price or TNM way to manage the contract as it goes forward. Uh, but realistically, you don't necessarily want to procure a certain number of sprints because depending on the human center design and if you're really building not toward the requirement but toward the user story, uh, you are going to adjust what success looks like over time. And so you don't necessarily, we in government don't want to be too prescriptive right off the bat. Um, and so what success looks like really falls on us. We have to define it. And then we have to write the quality assurance surveillance plan to make sure we're not just measuring, um, to Dave's point, that we're not just writing something for a non-performing vendor so that we can get them in trouble later and there's one throat to choke and all of this bad stuff. Um, the idea is that we should decide what it is we're looking for and that we should allow for iteration and for the agile process to actually work, which will mean that what you get may change over time. Right, that's, that's a good point there, Ella. Thank you so much for making that because uh, I, I'm on the other end of the stick, so to speak, working for a company that does bid for contracts. And we do see a lot of them coming through that have a specified number of sprints. And we always sit there and scratch our heads going, okay, well, what does this really mean? What's underneath this? We can't determine the intent necessarily from the government. So I'm really glad that you, uh, you mentioned that. Um, yeah, great answers. 
So I'm curious, Ben had had a good uh, answer as far, as far as how to adjust over time. Uh, have you guys been in situations where you realized uh, we're not quite making the mark as far as our measurements for success? We need to update that. Have you had to change that before? And what does that look like? So I'll start because um, <laughs> the one thing that we, as, as a project going into this agile, this new agile approach, was we didn't know what we didn't know. So as, as Ella said, it's really, really important that the government come to the table completely 100% ready and prepared. And we had uh, years and years and years of historical data and subject matter expertise, and we knew how to do per, you know, project management. And we brought in our first couple teams and we said, okay, what do we do? And they're like, you tell us. <laughs> um, you know, it's really, really important to have strong product owners. And we didn't know that. It's really important, as I said, to have a, back, a backlog of like a million stories to groom you know, on the, on, on the onset, and we didn't know that. And so, if anything, it's almost like the government got it in, in, in the way of itself. And we were the reason why product was not being delivered, not, not the vendors. The vendors, as Joe, you talked about, or Dave talked about, they're, they're experts. They'll, they'll come in and they'll knock out code like there's no tomorrow. That's not, that's not the problem. Mm -hmm. um, the problem we found is that the government itself got in the way, the way that we do oversight and, and, and IV and V and the way that we procure things. And, you know, we get on, we get a vendor on board and they say, and the first vendors that we, we, that we uh, procured, <clears throat> we asked them to, to bring software solutions, you know, give suggestions on how we should do things, how we should do um, uh, literally everything from collaboration to doing code check, code reviews. And so we literally didn't have any software to start. And so, one thing that's obviously an issue with government is to get a Slack account in the private sector takes about, you know, two minutes and a credit card. To get a Slack account in the state of California requires a, a procurement process and legal review and you have to get, go through and find a reseller and the next thing you know, it's six months later, you might have a Slack account. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> and so government itself is kind of the impediment to being successful in being agile and being flexible because it's really not set up that way it, it, it's it's really meant to be waterfall-y in the sense that you procure um, a vendor a large vendor to come in and do everything for you because everything is self-contained and then i just do oversight of that vendor to make sure that they're delivering exactly what i asked for mm -hmm. that is a major shift in the way that government is now moving towards these agile procurements and it is a struggle and a challenge Yeah, um, you know, and it's interesting kind of tying that back into a little bit of what we just talked about. Uh, someone asked a good question about um, the idea of changing this mindset, right? Changing it from this waterfall approach to something more dynamic, more fluid. And one of the biggest questions that I, I like here is this, you know, how do you get user stories socialized? And uh, is there a way to help people understand what the completion and technical requirements are for those things, in particular um, for procurement and, and IT staff to understand that? Because you're taking... I mean, I came from a, I just worked with a large uh, international bank recently and they were like, I'm a product owner. And I'm like, okay, what do you own? And they said, I own a server and I own a system of servers and things like that. And they had that concept in their mind, which is a whole new concept for a lot of organizations that build software or manage systems. So I'm curious to know, um, do you guys have any stories uh, or advice for how to socialize and manage those user stories and those kinds of ownership activities that are new to a lot of agencies? Florence, do you have a thought or Ala? Florence, you're muted. I see you speaking, but you're muted. I think you have to unmute your phone. Yep. Good now? Yep. Yep. We're good. Perfect. Okay. So, in terms of socializing um, the user stories, I think the successful. Um, experiences that I've had with that is that the product owner um, has worked well with user researchers and have really developed the user stories around what is it really that users need and want and have communicated clearly um, in terms of what they want the end result to be. Um, and people have looked at that to, to identify what is it that can be, like what marks along the way can we hit to ensure that we meet those needs um, and working it through either the program office um, or the different stakeholders to make sure that they understand 
what what is being developed, the product that's being developed overall, but how it's being rolled out incrementally in order to overall meet the user's need. Um, but it really has come like built up from um, working closely with whoever the end user and users are. Um, and I mean, that's been my experience in terms of the successful um, socialization of those user stories. I will say in the sort of, uh, in several agencies uh, that we have worked with, oftentimes uh, the user research that Florence mentioned had not been done, or, um, you know, it was outsourced to a requirements analysis company that just put together a 300 page uh, technical requirements document that was obviously going to be everything that you ever needed. Um, and so one of the things that um, we advocate internally in terms of, um, and obviously this is sort of like a, you got to take a couple steps back from the acquisition, but if uh, you find yourself doing a contract or trying to procure something where maybe the user research hasn't been done, think about whether there's an opportunity to create a contract that allows flexibility, whether from a labor category perspective or from a sort of sequencing and batching modularity perspective, where you can also pay to get that user research done first. Um, sort of like a step zero before anyone starts building. Oftentimes when folks talk about success in agile contracting and agile software development, you think about the outcome of sprints, but you often need to know what to build before the sprints begin. And if um, that is a capacity that the government team lacks, which often it is just because, you know, everyone's stretched thin, uh, we're sort of more of a PMO maybe than uh, an organization that has the in-house capacity to do that sort of user research. Think about contracting for that user research as a part of the contract vehicle. Um, this may mean that you are asking for a company that's probably going to subcontract that out, um, you know, because pl places that are experts in building may not be experts in researching, and that is okay. Um, but think about contracting for, and this is sort of a tactical answer, but think about labor categories, think about contract line item numbers, thinking about CLIN structures, um, a, a contract that allows you the flexibility to do the user research up front if you feel like it's lacking, which is to say um, the business owner may state an objective um, that will be in the contract, but in terms of the user stories themselves, you may be able to write a quality assurance surveillance plan that allows you to still do really great contract oversight without necessarily having all the user stories ready. Um, because to Florence's point, it's just so, so essential that the building is informed by actual user needs. Um, but if there isn't capacity to go and get those needs, that you contract for that also. You know, as, as project directors, we always like to say business drives technology. But ultimately, in water folly appro uh, approaches, you're writing technical requirements, system shell requirements to meet your business needs. And that is absolutely not driving uh, the, the process through the business. Um, user stories give us that option by going out and doing that user-centered design in advance and doing your user research and developing these user stories, you're ultimately saying that truly business is driving how something is going to get done through those stories. And then ultimately the technologist will create the tech technical requirements to meet those needs, especially through modern practices like test-driven development. So ultimately, it's, it's kind of circular. You're, you're taking what used to be a system shell requirement and then you're putting those, re those requirements in front of the user and the user's deciding how, how they want the application to be managed and how it should operate. And now you're truly de delivering um, a solution that is for the business versus technologists writing something that we're hoping will meet the business need. Um, one of the things that I can't emphasize enough, um, and I've said a couple of times, but I'm just going to like, sort of hammer it home, is the role of product management. Um, if you're delivering something that doesn't deliver value to the business and to an end user, you shouldn't build it, period. Like if it's, that's a waste of money, don't do that thing. Um, and good product management is trying to sort of bridge um, the business value and the user needs um, and if you're not able organizationally to, to do that because people say, well, we don't need to do with the user. We, we know our users. That's a really, that's a really big red flag. Um, and so I, I think that um, as we think about trying to elevate user stories, we really have to think in product terms, making sure that folks who understand that when we apply uh, 
taxpayer dollars to do something, it better actually deliver value to the government and deliver value to the to the people who ultimately use the system. Awesome, thanks, Dave. Yeah, and I think that brings up a good point. Maybe uh, for people who aren't aware of product ownership, it, this may be a whole new role, a whole new responsibility for people to think about. Like, how do I take this information that I'm being given? And how do I break that into something that can be delivered in an effective way? Uh, because you're used to doing that waterfall the approach has been said, and they say, okay, stack them up, here are all the requirements, and now hand that off to somebody else to go execute. So I'm sure people are kind of foreign to this concept of these smaller units of, of work and how they actually deliver them. Well, and, and it's also not a uniquely government issue. So even though, uh, you know, I, even though we, this is about government technology, uh, there's plenty of stuff that's crap out in the world. Like there's plenty of stuff that's actually, you know, not really good technology and not really good useful services. Mm -hmm. um, but when the government is, uh, you know, as the government is trying to deliver better services to the public, um, it needs to be using good practices and that includes product management, product ownership. Awesome. So I'm kind of curious, you know, Allah had mentioned how uh, ATF had the blog post that really helped her to become more aware uh, of lessons learned. Uh, does anyone else have a, a, a lesson that they'd like to share, a lesson that they've learned uh, maybe the hard way? I think Ben definitely has one or two. <laughs> what about Florence? Do you have something that you could share from uh, your experience so far where you go, uh, good lesson learned? Oh my goodness, so many lessons, <laughs> so many lessons. So um, gosh, I think part of it is really try as much as you can if, um, if you're an 1102 contracting officer or contract specialist to learn about the, about the customer, learn about, and by customer I mean who are the, who's the end user, who's, who, is, who is the product um, or software being developed for, and who are your counterparts or allies along the way. Um, because as a former contracting officer, I would be responsible for getting something for somebody would throw over the fence, you know, a PWS or, a sue and I'd read it, I'd have to read it, understand it, then like help have my team write requirements around it in terms of getting it out to be awarded, evaluation criteria and all of this. And there, because of volume and because of all of the work that we have coming to us in other ways, sometimes we don't have the time to like really dig in and understand what exactly are you buying. Um, a, a lesson learned that I'd like to share is just really take the time to get out there and meet your, um, meet the full team, the full IPT that is going to be working on this. And once the, once the contract is awarded, be involved in the, in the administration of it, not only from a contract perspective, but understanding how is this, how is this really rolling out? Um, because Agile is very different from Waterfall in, in terms of the amount of time that a team is engaged with one another um, and the kind of attention, it's like a garden that, that is constantly being tended. You really, everyone meets more frequently or should meet more frequently to understand what is going on um, to, to identify if, if it's working and if it's not working. Um, it, I think the traditional approach of waterfall is as a contracting officer, I would award something and then, you know, time would go three months, six months, 10 months, almost, almost to the 12th month. And you'd wonder, is, has it been built or has it not been built? Um, as opposed to with Agile, I would know and, be, and I would check in rather frequently with my core and with my um, technical experts, the SMEs on the ground, like how are things working? Can I sit in on um, the sprint planning sessions? Can I sit in on certain aspects of the, the process in order to really understand what's going on. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'll add a couple, a couple of lessons learned. I mean, there's a number of lessons learned and I think I've gone over a few of them, but another good example that we found is as much as possible, do informal procurement processes. Um, doing RFPs, which has a, which tends to be very formalized and, and it's very difficult to have uh, conversations with the vendor community. Doing our, our, in our case, doing RFOs or RFQs allowed us to have much more um, casual conversations and figuring out exactly how things would fit. And it also um, one of the one of the big 
things that we did at CWDS that is, is kind of uncommon, and I didn't even realize it was until I started having conversations with the vendor community, is, is giving feedback. So even after the procurement is done, I would sit down with each and every vendor and have a conversation on why they didn't win. Like, what, what did they do wrong? Or what didn't they do good enough to, to do better the next time? And, and the next thing you know is that with that constant feedback, you're getting better bids, you're getting better communication, they're starting to deliver teams and, and solutions that are specific to your need versus just a generic technology blurb that, uh, that really just can insert your project name here and, and hope that it, that it lands correctly. Uh, a lot of the bids we got early on, I felt like they were just Wikipedias on what is Agile and what is TDD, and they weren't exactly specific to the, my, my business need. And then what we found is, through those, that interaction with the vendor community over time, they started to get very specific to exactly what it was that I was looking for. They started to understand our, our project and, and what we were driving to, to do to be successful. And you started seeing that uh, a lot in, in the way that they were doing bids. So uh, again, I, I can't concur enough with Florence. I mean, whether it's through the, the contracting process or through your, even your, your procurement process, engage your vendors and communicate as much as possible, you'll be much more successful. And if I can underscore that, um, one of the ways and one of the reasons we're having this uh, meeting at all is, is thinking about ways to segment risk, right, and sell this new way of doing things so that you get better outcomes. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that we in contracting often manage outcomes is like we try and over-engineer a process that is uh, protest-proof or that will win the protest. Well, a great way to... Um, engineer around that is to not get protested in the first place because vendors feel as though they are heard, that they are treated with respect, that they're given an opportunity to really submit their best work. And one of the, uh, and a great way to do that is to focus on industry engagement and great vendor communication throughout the life cycle of the procurement process. So that means not just having one big bang industry day where, yeah, you know, your executive reads, reads from a script and then everyone goes home, but really thinking about ways to do vendor Q&A, bring folks in, actually talk about your problems that is, actually show folks maybe what the old system is, or really think about ways in which you can help industry understand the problem you're really trying to solve. Um, after bids, uh, to Ben's point, really think about debriefing as a tool you have in your toolkit. Um, I think there have been studies, I don't want to like quote out of context, but anecdotally, great debriefings have lowered protests um, because what, what capture managers and what folks in industry really want to know is why did I lose this bid? And oftentimes when we don't offer industry the opportunity to debrief or give them really crappy debriefs that don't actually talk about uh, their stuff is then when their manager asks, why did you lose this bid? They don't have an answer and they're sort of fo forced to do a protest in order to uncover their rating methodology or something else in government that maybe we haven't been forthright about. And so a great way to avoid all that is just to provide it to industry up front and really try and encourage that collaborative relationship. And one other thing Ben said that I can't agree with more is in the post award setting, really engaging industry and engaging your vendor pool to let folks know because the, if you're doing modular contracting, if you're building this thing in pieces, there'll be a bunch of other procurements coming up and getting, uh, getting industry ready and primed and giving them feedback about work already performed is really going to help you as government receive better work for the industry as well as better proposals in the whole nine yards. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Allah. <laughs> on, the, on the other end of this, I love it when I get feedback. It's huge. It's a big deal. It's like gold given to me by the government. It's like, good, now I know what was wrong and now I know where to maybe go the next time around. Because you, you, just like you guys, you put your heart and soul into these things, you want to make them right. And on the flip side, the, I think the, the vendors are trying to do their best to say, let's speak to this as clearly as we can, as directly as we can. And sometimes that can get lost in the shuffle with all the demand that you guys have to face on the uh, procurement side. Um, so a guy named Tim asked a really good question. He said, how do you convince your government to consider agile contracting? Uh, this concept's new to local governments, especially like Ben comes from a state government area, uh, state, local county governments. How do you tell them, hey, this might actually be worth your time? Anybody want to take a whack at that? Oh, I'll give that a shot. Okay. Truth is that it depends. I'm an attorney, so I have to say that. Um, the, uh, I don't think you can actually force anyone to do Agile. 
Um, it, it has to be something that people um, want. Um, it has to be something where you have to demonstrate that there's actual value. Um, and once you've been able to demonstrate value, then, then it's, you know, then it's figuring out how. Um, and so I think spending time with the uh, local and state governments and really saying, how do you feel about your delivery method? Like, do you think this is working for you? Does this feel good? And usually they'll be like, yeah, it feels good. And be like, so look, talk to me about change orders and modifications. How does that process? And they're like, oh God, it's awful. We end up doing a bazillion change orders and modifications. Like, well, what if there was a different way to manage that? Um, or like, you know, we always have this thing where we spend, you know, we deliver the system and then training happens and it, you, we spend like three weeks on training and then it doesn't work and we have crappy data. Well, it's like, well, maybe we should have better user interfaces and maybe we should actually do some design. Um, and thinking about sort of the outcomes in selling agile rather than trying to sell the the how uh, of agile i'd ask the first question the first question i would ask is uh, how are your users responding to the systems you're building are they happy uh are they not happy because if they're not happy it sounds like you're probably not engaging them enough um you could say that you have SMEs that are kind of representative of the the community working side by side but that doesn't necessarily give you a happy system um, <laughs> You know, um, every, every as, as David said, every every organization is going to be different. Um, you know, engaging uh, organizations like USDS and ATF helps a lot because they're really built to really speak the speak and, and convince. Um, I know personally, I've worked with a number of other departments within the state of California that are looking this way, and a lot of it is just a conversation. Lessons learned: How does it work? How does it not work? Will it work for me? Maybe I'll try it out on a smaller project. Uh, obviously child welfare was a huge project at the time it was close to a billion dollar system. Um, so to, to jump right into agile ways on a project that size can be a little crazy, some would say. Um, so starting smaller, proving that it can work, showing how basically going through a demonstration of, 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 uh, lessons learned. I mean, you're going to, you're going to fail, but at least you fail fast and you can, you can quickly make adjustments. Uh, starting at a smaller scale gives you that success criteria. So as you move through the process and you start learning how to be successful, then you can start um, getting getting into the larger projects and the larger the larger systems, the more long term systems. But um, ultimately, it, it, just like any project, you have to have your executive sponsorship. Like your, your executives have to buy in because if they're just waiting for you to fail so they can quickly swoop in and make, make change things back to the way they used to be, then, then how, how, how can you be successful? Um, and then ultimately you just have to trust that um, in, in the state government, especially we are, we are, we're built to allow vendors to do everything and we just do oversight. So uh, understanding that agile is not a fix for everything <laughs> mentality. You have to start taking on the role of the system integrator for these vendor vendor uh, contracts and start managing them much more uh, directly, which is not something that at least in the state of California we do very well. So it is it is not easy. There is no easy button. However, um, but what you do find is that the user community tend to be uh, much happier uh, because you're, you're through the agile process in the way that we do the user research and getting them engaged into the, the system builds um, tends to be much more successful. Awesome. And uh, Allah or Florence, would you have something to add to that as far as how to convince someone of, of how to go about the agile approach? Um, so I think part of it is um, like some of the others have said, um, really asking what their, what they've been satisfied with in the past and what they have not been satisfied with in the past and kind of leading it through questions and getting them. I'm not really into convince, trying to convince somebody if something is for them, but I'd, I'd rather kind of understand where they're coming from. And if something has not worked, leading them towards an, uh, you know, an alternative solution. Um, but I think what has been successful for me has also been tag teaming agencies or um, organizations that have not gone through this process before or have not delved into um, agile contracting or um, software development, you know, partnering them or showing them, you know, another similar sized agency or similar, similarly sized um, project so that they can talk to people who are, who can speak their language um, 
and understand where they're coming from in terms of this, these are some of the bumps in the road that we've had to get here, but we have been successful at the end of the day. Um, and we have seen success um, or we have seen failure in a much quicker way in order for them to understand um, that perhaps the way that they have been doing it, there's another way to, to, to go about doing it um, and finding success or failure in a faster way so that they can get to their end result of customer um, or user satisfaction. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's really what there's so much money being put towards these projects. Um, I do believe in if an agency or an organization has not done this before, starting small so that you build people's confidence and that's everyone's confidence from the executive to the contract specialist who's just starting out trying to figure out what to do and how to really build the contract the contract documents and the clean structure around it and the contract type there's so many people who are asking questions of how do you like logistically how do you do this um, and starting small and building the confidence of your team matters um, so once you have convince that organization or have them um, kind of move in that direction, starting small and making sure that everyone is comfortable or comfortable enough to start moving in that direction so that they know um, that they are not alone in it, that there are other people who have, who have walked that path and that they can reach out to allies or people who've done it before to ask the questions and learn from the mistakes of others because nobody wants to like step in it um, by themselves or on a project that they're doing. Um, but I think part of it, a large part of it is making sure that people know that this has been done before. Um, and sometimes it's been successful or sometimes it's been unsuccessful and a lot of times it's been successful, but walking them through that path and letting them know that they're not by themselves in this, you know, this is called the wild, wild west um, panel. <laughs> Um, but it, that it, it can feel like the Wild Wild West, but there are knowns in this that, that have been identified that can be shared across the board. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're almost at time. Uh, we probably have like uh, room for one more answer or one short question. Uh, let's see here. Ala, did you have anything else to add about uh, convincing your, your government counterparts on this? Local counties, maybe that kind of thing? No, Florence did a spectacular job answering the question, but given that we only have three minutes left, I, I would be remiss if I didn't plug a resource that I think is really good to the extent that folks want uh, more information or sample contracts or white papers or links to like old only memos uh, that Dave mentioned earlier. Uh, the site is modularcontracting.18f.gov, modularcontracting.18f.gov. I believe that's still the URL. Um, and uh, that has uh, a number of resources on it to the extent that folks want sample contracts or just to see how it's done. Um, sometimes it's just, um, it's great to see what a cost looks like for one of these things. It's great to see, um, oh yeah, thank you Melinda for dropping that in. Um, uh, this is a site that I'm a little biased. My team maintains it. So I think it's pretty good. And hopefully uh, and it's um, designed for not just the federal audience, but state and local folks as well. And it has both resources and case studies and a number of other things. So uh, go forth and read. Awesome. And while, while we're in the plugging context, I'd like to plug the folks who are in this room. Um, so this is the uh, cohort of the Digital IT Acquisition Professionals Program, um, which is a really excellent resource for federal, uh, federal contracting professionals, acquisition professionals. Um, so it's a delight to be with other folks who are learning how to do uh, digital services acquisition. Awesome, smarter people coming out of the woodwork here. This is great. Well, um, Elizabeth, would you like to close us out at this point? Sure, yes, thank you all for participating. We had a great panel today and for the audience for asking questions. Um, we're gonna post a link to the video on agilegovleaders.org. We welcome you to find us there or um, on Twitter. Melinda just put a bunch of links in the chat. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody, for the panel. I really appreciate it. I thought it was great. Have a good day.